Welcome to Policy Matters. Our goal is to keep you informed on the upcoming election, how it affects you, and why it matters. I'm your host, Dr. Laura Merrifield Wilson. The three candidates competing to be the next governor of Indiana appeared together for the last time on the debate stage Thursday night. Democrat Jennifer McCormick, Republican Mike Braun, and Libertarian Donald Rainwater participated in the IDC gubernatorial debate, answering voter questions about the environment, labor regulations, and taxation, among other issues. Braun and McCormick regularly sparred with each other, challenging the merits of experience and each other's stances on the issues. Rainwater criticized Braun for being a government insider based on his political career at the federal, state, and local levels of government. The Democratic Governors Association donated $450,000 to McCormick's campaign, while the Republican Governors Association contributed half a million dollars to Braun. Braun has significantly outfundraised McCormick, $12 million to $2 million. This was the final of three gubernatorial debates this election cycle. The candidates are on the ballot for the Indiana governor on November 5th. Two of three of the candidates competing to represent Indiana in the U.S. Senate will participate in the first and only debate for their office this cycle. Democrat Valerie McRae and the Libertarian will answer voter questions in an hour-long TV special organized by the Indiana Debate Commission. Republican Jim Banks, who currently serves in the U.S. House of Representatives from Indiana's 3rd Congressional District, has not confirmed his participation. The U.S. Senate this cycle will show several critical races as a toss-up, lending to the likelihood that Republicans may be able to flip the institution, which is currently dominated by Democrats. Analysts are watching Ohio, Montana, and Arizona as races that are especially tight and may determine the balance of the Senate after the election. Indiana's seat is not viewed as competitive. This seat's presently held by Mike Braun, who announced he was leaving the Senate after his term ends this year to seek the Indiana's governor's office. The Washington Post has decided not to endorse in this year's presidential race. This is the first time they've made this decision since the 1980s. The presidential race is now neck and neck between former President Donald Trump and current Vice President Kamala Harris. But that's still not influencing the Washington Post's decision to not endorse a candidate. The publisher and CEO announced the news, saying, we're returning back to our roots of not endorsing presidential candidates. The LA Times has made a similar decision to not back a certain candidate this term. This decision was made at the owner after the board had proposed backing Kamala Harris and caused employees of the LA Times to rapidly resign. Times owner, Dr. Patrick Soon Chiang, said in an interview with the Times, I have no regrets whatsoever. In fact, I think it was the exactly right decision. Chiang also released a statement saying he didn't want the LA Times to back one candidate, only to create deeper divisions in our country. Join me after this break for your weekly history lesson with co-host Levi Alt. In the heart of Indianapolis, our main mission is to keep you informed, bringing you local and national news. With the upcoming presidential election, there's no better time than now to tune in. But the most important part is you. This is UND TV News. The Senate's poised to potentially return to Republican control, and the race for the White House is still undecided. The outcome could lead to unified or divided government. In this period of uncertainty, it's important to understand the effects of both scenarios and their impact for policymaking. In the past, a unified government has often led to swift policymaking and implementation. When the same party holds both Congress and the presidency, this relationship between government bodies allows for a streamlined process and fewer partisan roadblocks. This has led to an effective achievement of legislative goals albeit sometimes at the cost of limited bipartisan input. A divided government, when opposing parties control the White House and Congress, presents unique challenges. And examples of this can be the 2011 debt ceiling crisis or repeated government shutdowns. Divided governments often lead to standstills in our government because of the struggle to implement policy due to ideological divisions. However, a divided government can foster compromise on major issues 
and make attempts to balance perspectives. Regardless of who wins the White House, the party breakdown of Congress will shape how a future administration approaches their policies. For either a Democrat or Republican, it will be harder to implement their promises that they make to constituents with a Congress controlled by the other side of the aisle. Joining me now is student Levi Alt. Hi, Levi. Hi, Professor. Hey, so what do you think about this likelihood that we may in fact have divided Congress yet again? Oh yeah, I think it's incredibly likely that we will have a divided Congress come November. Um, and actually for the first time, isn't this crazy, in American history that we could have both chambers of Congress flipped in the opposite direction. So Democrats could gain control of the House and Republicans could gain control of the Senate, which would go in opposite directions that they are now. So uh, I think the polls bear, bear this out. I think it's likely. Um, but yeah, that whoever wins the presidency, it's going to affect uh, how each president will be able to formulate their, their policy objectives. Do you think it'll lead to any compromise, or do you think the parties are too set in stone? And well, I love I love the optimism <laughs> of compromise. I, I know I think a lot of these national issues are going to be really difficult with divided government, but quite frankly, they'd be hard even if the government was unified. Yeah. Um, because when we talk about things like immigration, for example, um, even the Democrats and the Republicans with own, within their own sphere have a lot of divisions in terms of how they'd approach those policies. Yeah. What's the best way to approach immigration? Yeah. Um, and so it's not even just working across the aisle, quite frankly. I think it's working within yeah, the party. Yeah, whip your, you know, your party into, you know, there's so much divisions, even within Republicans, about aid to Ukraine. And we already see how divided uh, the House is on the Republican side. Absolutely. Um, over, you know, having Marshall, you know, unable to choose their speaker. Um, threats of ousting Mike Johnson currently, there's a lot of division there as much as there's the Democrats along Gaza, uh, sustainability. Right now it's a very, even if a party does have a unified government, it'll be hard to force all members of the party to agree on certain policy objectives. So it's looking like no matter what happens, it's going to be a very contested point in American history. And I don't disagree with that at all. I think probably the biggest thing that depends is who's in charge of the White House. Yeah. And I, I think that's where the leadership will really matter, the approach that the new president takes in terms of working with a divided Congress. Yeah. It seems like Joe Biden really struggled to be able yeah. to be effective. Um, and quite frankly, that's probably true of many modern presidents. Yeah. But whether it's President Trump again, or if we're looking at President Harris, yeah. how they're able to work both within their party and across yeah. the aisle in divided government yeah. to get to some and, of those issues you're discussing. And like you were saying too, when you have an, un for Democrats, when you have an unfriendly Supreme Court that is more apt to strike down some of your uh, presidential uh, 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 executive orders and stuff, that's also gonna make it more challenging for a Democrat, maybe compared to Donald Trump, who has um, placed three members of that SCOTUS, uh, on SCOTUS that he has now that he might have a better opportunity to pass some of the policies that he wants unilaterally outside of congressional oversight. So I think, yeah, that um, Donald Trump will probably have a better time at passing through some of his policy objectives, um, only because of SCOTUS's alignment. Yeah. Well, up next, we wanted to hear from some of the Generation Z, these younger voters, on their biggest influences in the upcoming presidential election. Stay tuned. <laughs> Good morning, Greyhounds, and welcome back to Wednesday Show. We have some very exciting things to talk about with our very special guest. So what do you find unique about you and me, and what kind of people do you hear? What are you doing? I'm watching Good Morning Greyhounds every Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. In the heart of Indianapolis, our main mission is to keep you informed, bringing you local and national news. With the upcoming presidential election, there is no better time than now to tune in. But the most important part is you. This is UND TV News. As the 2024 presidential election approaches, a new generation of voters are preparing to make their voices heard. Voting based on a group of very specific issues that seem to be more important than Gen Z, uh, there are 41 million members of uh, Gen Z that will be able to vote this upcoming election. Based on a study conducted by Why Vote, a New York nonprofit, the issues that seem to hold the most weight are women's reproductive rights, climate change, and gun violence. 
Today we have two Gen Z UND students with us to discuss who they're voting for and what draws them to each candidate. So I want to welcome you to our show today. Do you mind introducing yourself to our audience, telling us what you're studying, what year you are in school, and partisan-wise, where you see yourself in elections? Yes. So I'm Adriana Ojeda. I'm a communications and criminal justice major. I will be graduating this December. Congrats. Oh, and um, I'm also um, part of the Republican Party, and I'm very excited to tell you guys why I'm voting. Terrific. Uh, I'm Brady Davis. I'm a second year political science student with a pre-law focus, um, and I would describe myself as a, a Democrat. So can I ask the first question, have you been able to vote in elections before, or will this be the first time that you're voting? Uh, for me, this will be my first time only because a couple of them I wasn't really like going to vote, but this one I feel like it's more important to vote. Uh, the only election I've been able to was the spring primary, which I did vote in. Oh, nice. Okay. How, how are you guys feeling about this upcoming election? We're only eight, eight days away. I can't believe it. Are you excited? Do you, do you both plan on voting? And if so, um, how do you feel about it? I do plan on voting. Um, I definitely believe it's definitely important for all of us to vote. Um, it's a way to get our voices heard out. And I'm just excited because it's a chance for us to get to see each other. Uh, I'm very excited for the election. Uh, I will 100% be voting. Um, I think that voting is the most fundamental thing you can do in the United States, and I think it's important that everyone does. Now, Levi and I have, the, and I have had this opportunity to talk to you um, experts, professionals about different topics um, for this show. Every week this month we've talked about um, social policy and foreign affairs and different components of the election that we think might be really important. Can, can you tell us what's motivating your vote? What are the things that you're thinking about when you're going into the ballot box and, and what are the issues that you think are most important this cycle for voters like you? Um, I definitely think one is definitely like the gun violence and the gun control, and definitely like with the abortions. And basically, when I'm just voting, I'm just making sure my values are being lined up with who's being out there. Uh, personally, for me, the candidate's character is one of the most important things. Um, Harris has a great character. He's worked for the Senate. He's worked as a uh, district attorney in general. Um, general prosecution for the state of California, where Trump has, to me, a low moral character in his attempts to overthrow a democratically elected candidate in 2020. Um, to me, that's something that I can never vote for. I, can, I can't see past that. So one thing I'm really curious about, because you, you identified that you really care about having um, a politician that aligns with your views. Um, are there, so let's say a, a, a politician maybe entirely or closely aligns with what you believe in but maybe there's something about their character or something that, that makes it hard uh, to vote for them. Um, does that outweigh your policy preference? Does your policy preferences outweigh the character of the person you're voting for? Um, to me, personally, like, yes, I'm voting for Trump, but I don't agree with everything he says. I do believe he just tends to ramble on a lot without really saying much, but at the end of the day, he is part of the Republican Party, which values a lot of my lining. Just because I don't really like him as a person doesn't mean I have to go against my values. Yeah. I'm wondering, especially with younger voters, a lot of times we hear people say that I just don't understand the elections or I just don't care. Both of you have indicated um, you're planning on voting and it sounds like you're very engaged in terms of politics. Could you tell us, for younger voters that might be watching and like, I don't really, I'm not interested in participating, like why, why should they consider voting this election cycle? Voting is the most fundamental way to get your, vote, your voice heard. Um, it is the most unanimous. It is the great equalizer. Everyone's vote counts the same. As hard as it is to say in Indiana, um, everyone's vote does count the same. Um, you should vote to amplify your voice and what you believe in to fight for your beliefs. I definitely agree with him um, because if you don't like, if you basically don't say like, oh, like my vote doesn't matter, but it does, it's essentially you're helping 
who like your voice, somebody who is qualified to get you what you want and need. Yeah, and I think what Dr. Wilson says is that a lot of students or a lot of young people in general, they may not know like a lot about politics. So like what's one like what's one places or places that you predominantly get your 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 political news from? Is it social media? Is it traditional media? What where do you get your political news? Mine's a mixture of both. So I will get it from the traditional and social media. I tend to like try to get it as from sources that are not like Yes, I'm Republican, but I'm not going to automatically believe in Fox News telling me everything, nor am I going to just dismiss others. I want to make it as fair and even so I'm educated on what I'm doing. I think there's a lot of good resources out there for people who are looking to be educated from both sides. Um, for specific things for the election, I think 538 is always a great resource. They have a great podcast to tell you about um, what's happening with voting and polling and political analysis like that. Um, but I stick to usually more traditional means, I guess, um, things like the AP, stuff that's reputed, um, that has been critically viewed for a long time. Are you worried after the election that we might have something like the January 6th insurrection or there might be violence or is some kind of turmoil and upheaval? I know I've heard that from a lot of voters, and not just younger voters, but especially when this is the first time you've had the opportunity to participate in an election. It's really exciting. There's also for some folks, that concern of violence after the fact, right? Does that play into account in, in terms of what you're looking at, or do you, is that something that you see potentially happening? Uh, I think it depends on who wins the election. Um, I think if Trump wins the election, I doubt there's been much violence. There's probably going to be protests either way, no matter who wins, but um, Democrats have been talking a lot in this election about how it's important to maintain legitimacy in government and conceding the election when you know you've lost. Whereas Trump has already shown his track record. He has incited violence before. And I don't see a reason to not believe that he would do it again. Um, I personally believe that, yes, there will be protests because at the end of the day, we are based on, oh, well, I didn't get my way, so I'm going to complain about it. However, the violence part, like January 6th, didn't really scare me at first, but also it's just like, I'm not there, so like it's not really affecting me. What if it happened in the State House? Because there have been those kind of moments where uh, something happens nationally and then it kind of spreads too. Like, w would that make a difference, do you think? I feel like it could because it's just like, oh, it's getting <coughs> like closer to home. Um, but I also believe like you just have to base it on your moral values. So one thing I'm uh, really interested in is there's been a lot of accusations thrown around this election of uh, the quality of Donald Trump. Some say that he's an authoritarian, that he's a fascist. In fact, two of his former, what, his chief of staff, uh, Kelly, and one of his former generals, these are all people that he would have appointed, have recently called out and said that he's a, and blatantly said that he's a fascist and that he shouldn't be able to hold on to the most powerful uh, position um, on the planet, arguably. When you see these things getting thrown around about your candidate, does it alarm you? Does it, uh, is it effective at all? Or do you think that it's just political hacks that maybe are just being partisan? What's your, what's your observation or opinion on that? Well, I definitely do believe, of course, there's going to be, for any candidate, really, somebody's going to be like, oh, well, I don't like them. So like they're automatically this, and they're a monster. But at the end of the day, I look at, like, when Trump was president, what he had done. And he'd done a lot of great things. Like I said, you may not like the person, but at the end of the day, you have to look at like, okay, like what do they do? Um, what do they plan on doing? And just inform with your best self. Brady, as a Democratic voter, how do you get motivated to participate in some of the Indian elections where it feels like it's a foregone conclusion um, and the state seems very, one side of Republicans. Do you see uh, a path forward for Democrats to be more successful this election cycle? Or how do you have that kind of encouragement to participate, even when it feels like your party won't be as successful at the state level? Yeah, absolutely. I think it is a it is a difficult thing to do. But I think that Democrats do have a path forward in the state of Indiana. There was success. I mean, we voted for Obama in 2008. There is a real path forward for Democrats in the state. There just has to be a consistent effort to mobilize voters. There has to be a renewed sense of hope for Democrat voters. 
that we can see change in the state. We're already seeing it in this election. I mean, it's a much closer election than it should be. I mean, 12 million to 2 million in funding, and it's within 15% in polling is pretty incredible to me. What makes it a successful election for Democrats this year? Like, what would be the the margin of success that you'd say, yes, it was a good, it was a good election for them? Um, if the gubernatorial um, race is within 10%, I'm calling it a success. To okay. me, that's within the rate to be winning within the next 12 years. And so, on strategy-wise, um, what do you think the most effective tool Democrats should be using to get out the vote and to um, increase their their base in this election? It could be for on a local level, on uh, the national level of Paris. In what way should and what what should Democrats be prioritizing? Should they be focusing on framing Trump uh, as a fascist, or should they be focused more on you know economic issues, abortion, and on a local level? What do you think Democrats should highlight? I think it's an interesting question. Um, I think Republicans have really moved the focus of the issues today to national levels. You have Mike Braun talking about immigration, which is a much more national issue. And I think that's a weakness that Democrats can really attack on. I think there's a space there for Democrats to say, so your Republicans that have been in power for 20 years in the state have lost focus. They've lost the thought on what's important. They're focused on what's happening in Washington. We're focused on Hoosiers in Indiana. And I think that's an important thing that can really be pressed down to win voters who are younger like me, who can be the next generation of Indiana voters. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that too in terms of younger voters, because a lot of times when we look at election blocks, I right, would say that Republicans tend to attract more older voters, right? Um, and sometimes more male voters. So can you describe like, what's appealing in terms of the Republican Party for voters like you that showcase some of the diversity we don't always, I think, typify with the party? Yeah, I definitely think it's because one, I have more of I'm like, okay, yeah, just because, like, one, yes, I know the statistics of Republicans, they get the older generation and the male voters, and looking at me, I'm Hispanic, and I'm female, and I'm young, but I was just like, okay, if I take a part of who I am, and I divide it up, it's just like, the Republicans have more of my values, and I'm just not going to base, like, oh, well, I'm just different, so I'm just gonna go through the Democrats, because to me, the Democrats don't really have all of my values in mind. Because I do believe that, you know, everything should be. Yeah, and what are some of your biggest issues, like as a voter? Like, when you're trying to ascertain which president aligns more with me, I think you touched upon a little bit, but like, like what's your go-to if they don't align on me with this and I, I can't vote for them? Um, it would definitely have to be with you know, I'm more based like with the abortion thing. I don't believe you should just get an abortion and just call it for your birth control. I believe every life is valuable, no matter at what stage it is at. Um, so just like throwing around like those terms or just being like, oh, well, just because like there's a lot of crime violence rates and guns doesn't mean like you shouldn't ignore your second amendment because we've had that place since the American Revolution. And I just don't think we should like throw out all the old values that we had in the Constitution just to like appease everyone. Mm -hmm. So as younger voters, and this is kind of our final question here, but I think it's really important. We're talking about Generation Z. How do you see yourselves being different from older generations? Like myself, I'm a millennial, you have Gen X, boomers, what sets your generation apart? Um, I think it comes with a lot of what politics you grew up in. So those older voters grew up with JFK, LBJ, these big um, liberal, uppercase L liberal um, with ideas of globalization, where today I think we're seeing a retraction of that. Um, there are candidates now pushing for more populist ideals in the US, which are contrary to what we've seen for the last 100 years post FDR. Um, and I think that's going to be the biggest marker of our political time. Okay, like a non-educated um, thing is definitely social media. Social media is definitely worldwide and we're hearing everybody's opposing view, whether you agree with it or disagree with it. Social media is big. It's Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, Facebook, every single one of those and you can have your voice out there and state what you want. We want to thank you both for joining us today for your insights in terms of politics. And thank you for joining us. You can tune into Policy Matters every Tuesday at 10 a.m. on YouTube at UNDTV 
and Xfinity Channel 1096 to find out important information on the upcoming election and why it matters. I'm Dr. Laura Merrifield-Wilson. And I'm Levi Alt.